Welcome to Hello Hockey here on Edmonton Sports Talk. Tom Gazzola, Sean Bell, YouTube Trev with you on this Saturday morning in balmy Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, sitting at a sexy minus 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, We hope you're warm out there. Drive safely on the roads. They are slick. And if you're tuning in today, we appreciate you as always. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Good morning. Hope that coffee's warm. Perhaps a tea, maybe something else. I don't know, six o'clock or lager? Fantastic. The third tank and the shipment from that going out next week. Really? Really. Well, that's fantastic. I know that I've got a keg sitting at uh, Sinai Center at the Summit. Love it. Anytime we have a game, I can just pop upstairs and have a quick cold one. Shout out to Potts as well out in Fort Sask. They went to the 50 liter tanks. Really? Yes. They burned Man. through the 20 liter tanks. That's unbelievable. And then also, uh, we've got Mr. Mike's on 137th in St. Albert Trail and Shamrock Curling Club, where we'll be on location live tonight Ooh. for the Oil Stream pre and post game show. It is the. Oilers alumni bond spiel. Yeah. I've got a game, so I can't go. Damn it. I know. We would have been on the team. I was looking forward to it. Together. You know what? I made it to the semifinals last year. I was an unbelievable skipper. I believe it. I believe Gager that. didn't do anything and made it to the finals. I thought Just he won. Rode the coattails of these Joaquin. of four girls that were legit curlers. I need them. Because I yeah. do not curl well. Well, that's why you gotta be skipper. Gotta be skipper. Uh, so Shamrock Curling Club uh, will be there live on location tonight for the pre and post game show. They've got six o'clock or lager, and I think you and I managed to twist the rubber arm of the good folks at local public. Evening, I think we did, Jasper Avenue. I think we did, Dean Lowry and Sonny. They are gonna have the six o'clock or lager. Oh, unbelievable! Oui. Wow. We oui. good morning. Whatever you're enjoying. Uh, Cheers to you. This is uh, Americano. Uh, also, I should say that uh, this is the morning coffee portion of Hello Hockey, brought to you by the good folks at Fox Coffee. Check them out. Just two blocks south of Rogers Place, 104th Street, with the main location opening up soon. They've got the pop-up shop going right now, uh, where it's right adjacent to where the main location is being constructed as we speak, uh, but they are up and running with the pop-up shop selling coffees. Those donuts are so good. Unbelievable. They are uh, uh, they are vegan-esque, or they're vegan. They're nut-free. Nut-free. Allergen-free. Sure. Yep. So all that good stuff, and they're delicious. And you can also get 10 varieties of the beans. Uh, we do have the Bali version right here uh, over at Fox Coffee. Check them out. Local. Great coffees, super nice folks, and uh, I, I've dealt with Cassandra. She's she's awesome. Yeah, so I know we've got coffee snobs in our city. They'll love Fox Coffee. What? <laughs> Johnny, what are you laughing at Johnny Boychuk? What do he say? Such a clown. I was just gonna get into I'm our guest. I'm, t- I'm texting Johnny, and I'm like, "Hey, we're good, right? No answer, no answer. Laugh out loud today? Question mark." Johnny, just take a look at her text messages. <laughs> like hurting cats. And then he's like, yeah, I'm good. Okay, oh, okay. so jo- we have Kevin Rodomsky coming up from yeah. the Edmonton Oil Kings at 1030. Yeah. When is Johnny coming up? I don't know. Let's put he him has in no, after He has after no John, idea after when Kevin. he's coming. Okay. All right. Okay, so today on the show, <laughs> Kevin Rodomsky from the Edmonton Oil Kings, Director of Business Operations, will join us at 1030. Evidently, Johnny Boychuk's good to go. Apparently. That's great. Uh, player development for the New York Islanders, a nice addition. Uh, let's get him in 1045-ish. Tell him 1045-ish. Tell him 1045, him. brush your teeth. Yeah, please. And uh, we'll also touch base <laughs> with our Hello Hockey insider, David Pagnotta at 11. 30. Uh, we will get to the toe drag swag results from this past week, and we got to get the winner out there. Thank you to everyone who voted. We appreciate you. We're making toe drag swag a, a thing. Uh, brought to you by Backscape, of course, and uh, so we'll do that. Also, text us, 780-218-9999, or get at us in the nasty chat. You know we appreciate it. I see a bunch of people texting in. Already, uh, Mick Fosidel said, did Tommy actually make it to work today? 
I was the first one here. Well, Trev was technically, but Trev and I showed up together at the same time. Not together together, but at the same time. So it's nice. Good. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> VR Montenegro says, hello, hockey fans. And Joel is saying that it is minus one where Joel is, and uh, it's actually feeling like minus six. Lucky. That's tropical compared to where we're at right now. Joel, don't come in here and do that. Ouch. All right, Belzy. It's minus 5,000 outside. It is minus 5,000. And you're going to come in here into this group chat that's all peaceful, and you're going to stir the pot with your minus one? Yeah. 12 games on the NHL schedule. How dare you? (laughs) you? I was ready to move on. 12 games on the sked. Lots to get to in regard to the games that will be played uh, today. Or is today the 16 day? 16 game day. It might be. Did you update that? I think today's the big one. Today's the the crazy, busy game day. It's a very busy day in today, sports. In today's general. sixteen games. We've got NFL football going on. It's just everybody's crazy. playing. Everybody's in the playing. Hockey League. Everywhere. Everywhere. What matchup are you looking forward to? Um, I would love to tell you that uh, it's an NHL matchup, but it's not. It's actually a football matchup. Dolphins take on the Chiefs. Okay. The Dolphins run the ball. They may win if they decide to throw. Minus 5,000 in Kansas City Minus 5,000 in Kansas City as well. Mm. They're going to lose. In terms of hockey, though, there's a few matchups. Colorado-Toronto. That should be good. Some high-powered offenses. Yes. It'll be really interesting to see. New Jersey-Florida. Yeah. That's an... Interesting, it's an intriguing matchup. It's an intriguing matchup in the sense that both teams are really good, but when you for face value, when you look at New Jersey versus Florida, you're like, meh, that's not going to be a fun matchup. But both really good teams, yeah. contrasting styles. Yeah. Maybe you see, uh, you know, these could be some of the top teams coming out of the East, potentially. New Jersey's got some work to do, don't they? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. If, Philly and Winnipeg. I was just going to say Philly and Winnipeg. Mm-hmm. If I floated that to you, the Jets are on fuego. They are. The Flyers are putting fire. together a good season. Yes, they have. The Flyers in the news a Multiple lot. times. Before we get to toe drag swag, your take, and then we're, we're going to talk to Dave Pagnotta about everything with the Cutter Goche stuff and, and the Kevin Hayes implications and the John Tortorellas. After everything we've seen and heard today, mm-hmm. or to this point, how do you look at this situation? How do you assess what has happened subsequently? Tortorella ripping the media, uh, Goche dealing with Philadelphia Flyers fans, keyboard warriors, Kevin Hayes dealing with the fallout and saying that, you know, the report about him and having an influence saying don't go to Philadelphia and all and, Whatever that scenario was. So was that was that debunked that he, he did that, though? I think so. Yeah. By Tortorella himself. I believe so. Yeah, Tortorella defended Hayes. And, yeah. and I, those were two guys that didn't see eye to eye. Yeah. It's a very unique situation because it doesn't happen very often. And so because it doesn't happen very often, obviously this is magnified beyond belief. It's crazy. Now... I'm not going to pass judgment on the kid yet because at the end of the day, we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. Nobody does. There's speculation. Of course. You know, based on people's knowledge, there has to be somebody in his ear saying something because when you look at just the the facts, he went to draft day mm-hmm. and he was like, oh, I'd love to be a flyer and blah, blah, blah. Built it's great. Flyer, and all that yeah, kind of stuff, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And then now we're, what, two years removed? Yes. Almost. Almost two years removed, and now he's just like, I won't even talk to these guys. It's There's something there. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to pass judgment on the kid yet. No, we're not asking you to pass judgment. But from what I know, there's, there's multiple different things. Let's tee this up, because you were a first-round draft pick. Yep. Okay? You were also, you, you've done some agent work as yep. well. You deal with prospects. You coach kids now. 
this is your perspective on this. This so is yeah. This I is just, just want, my perspective. I just want to give your background I, I, on this. Yeah, like I, I there's there's a lot of different things that go on with making decisions, and you know, coaching's one of them. Mm-hmm. It's who's behind the bench. Is this guy going to give me a good relationship? I actually just saw a quote from um, um, David Quinn, who's an old coach of mine, and he's yes. like, "There's no way now." in hockey that you can't make relationships with your players. If you pretend that you're going to make relationships with your players, these guys will see right through you. They think you're phony, then they don't trust you. So is this a situation that's happening now? And based off of knowledge and, and obviously reports in the media, guys either love Tortorella Mm -hmm. or they hate Tortorella. I'm not going to lie, and There's I've said it on the station. In between. I dislike his act yeah, or his approach. So could that be something that happened? I I immediately assumed that that had something to do with it. Was Danny Breer the the GM no. when could it be a situation of where, like, the, the old GM really had a great relationship with Gauthier, now Breer's in there, and all of a sudden he doesn't know him at all? But Breer was part of the management team before it, this whole situation doesn't make sense because we don't know what's behind the curtain how often does a guy people again have speculated that he was a huge penguins crosby fan growing up but even if you are you, you play in the nhl to like play if in the you NHL. were drafted by the calgary flames in the first round i'm going you're a calgary flame i'm going dion Phaneuf, born and raised in edmonton yeah straight down to qe2 jerome again straight down the qe2 after being traded from Dallas. Yeah. Mr. Flame. Yep. It is what it is. You're playing in the National Hockey League. You're one of 637 players to play in the National Hockey. You're in the top league in the across the world. You play where you play. The only guy really that's ever done this is Eric Lindros. And Eric Lindros came out and said there was a legitimate reason why he did not want to go to Quebec. And I believe it was the ownership, was it not? I just saw that about the owner, that there was something shady yeah. about the, the owner in Quebec that bothered him. Yeah, so... The story for decades was that he didn't want to play in Quebec, and it's a super French city, and it's a tiny market in, in the NHL landscape, even at that time. Man, if he would have went there, with they had, the guys that they were loading they up with Joe at that Sackick. time... They had Matt Sundin. Yeah, they did. They had Owen Nolan. All due respect to Peter Forsberg, but if you put Lindros on that team, where does it go? Well, they did win two Stanley Cups I know they by did. trading him. I, I know they did, but they got an absolute haul. Yes, they did. But they, tra- they traded Nolan. Yeah. They traded Sundin. Yes. They for Wendell tra- Clark. For, <laughs> for Wendell Clark, yeah. I know Clark was, was really good. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, going back to Goche, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just a really it's a really odd situation. And there's got to be some factors behind the scenes that were that we just haven't figured it out. And once that happens, once that comes to light, because things don't take that long anymore, then there's a, then we can pass judgment on the situation. For me, I just I, I don't want to say anything because I don't know what is actually going on. Right. Again, we speculate, we speculate, we speculate. But Again, using your history, knowledge, expertise, and experience in the Something's game. Something's going on behind the scenes why and somebody said something. Speaking? Like, do you think there's, there, there has to be well, someone just, in his ear saying, don't say Well, anything. 100%, because the minute he said he didn't want to be in, or I guess he didn't say that, he got yeah. traded, and then it found out that there was a bit of a smear campaign by the Philadelphia Flyers, where it was like, this guy doesn't want to come, he doesn't even want to talk to us, well, look what happens. You get on Twitter, and you just rip these guys. And so, yeah, now he's got to probably turn off his Twitter. He's got to turn off his Instagram because for whatever odd reason, since social media has come out, and in particular in the last few years, if something happens where a fan base doesn't like it, it's like, let's go. We're going to get this guy. We're going to make his life miserable. It's awful. It's awful. It's scary, man. Just look at the situation yesterday at the Chicago Bulls game. I missed that. The former, the former owner, um, was it Jerry Krause, who Maybe. brought the six championships? Yeah, he was not the greatest business guy in the world. He wasn't the easiest to deal with. Yes, he was a guy that basically blew up that whole team. 
but he brought you six championships. He had Scotty, he had Phil Jackson, he had MJ, mm-hmm. and they booed his wife. This guy's dead, and they booed his wife. Wow. So I guess that's kind of my point. It's well, like if you're if I'm telling this client, well, yeah, let's don't say anything because it's gonna get bad for you. So we live in an interesting time. 780-218-9999 or via the Nasty Chat. Share your thoughts. Uh, also, what games are you looking forward to tonight? And, uh, of course, I'm assuming a lot of people will be saying, Oilers, Oilers and Habs. Pre-game show, 3.30 p.m. We're live on location. Tonight, I am with, uh, I think, I don't know if Cass is playing. He's been, he's back, which how's, is great. How's he doing? His, he sounds like, he sounds like he's been smoking a pack a day for 23 years. <laughs> but he's back, baby. Great to have him back. Uh, thank you for stepping in for him a couple of times. Oh, yeah, thank no you, Joaquin Gage, for stepping in. Thank you, Ben Scrivens, for stepping in for Matty Cassian. But he's back, and that's great. Uh, so I'll be on location at the Shamrock Curling Club. Oilers alumni bomb spiel. Is it spiel or spiel? Spiel. Bon spiel. Oh, and make sure you say skip, not skipper, because that'll what get happened? you. In, that'll get you in trouble. Oh. Okay. Okay. Is that better, Ken? Oh, Ken texted in. 780-218-9999. Also, Chris says, very, very, very sad ESC didn't whip up a birthday special exclusive for McDavid on Cool Bet. This is shame. I blame Dusty. So Get at I. him. So do I. Get at him. Wind it up. Wind it up. Uh, this text comes in, says, not much about torts. Gets young's, young players excited. When things are going well, he should be praising and supporting his team. When things are going south, he should be standing in front, sheltering his team. I find he puts too much of the results on the team, lack of leadership, and we all know strong, positive leadership. Who is that that just texted? Nameless? Nameless. Huh. Why? I don't know. I think I just got the same text. Literally on your Literally on phone? my mobile device. Oh. Cool. Huh. 780-218-9999, Nasty Chat, do your thing. The Wolf says, happy Saturday. Hello, hockey. It's early, I know, but what a day to be a hockey fan. Flower missing the chance in overtime to jump over Roy's most wins, and the Oilers can possibly set a franchise record tonight. We don't have warm weather, but we do have, hello, hockey. Signed, The Wolf. Oh. Good morning, The Wolf. Yes, uh, <laughs> Oilers going for a franchise record. Tenth straight Victory, myself, Matty Cassian, and the mustachioed one at YouTube, Trev, will have the pregame show for you right here at 3.30 p.m. Hope you're staying warm out there. And uh, we do have a great show in store for you. We're going to be joined in about 10 minutes by the one and only Kevin Radomski, Director of Business Operations for the Edmonton Oil Kings. They're in action in Red Deer tonight. And then back home tomorrow afternoon, it's Elvis night. Ooh. So we'll ask uh, K-Rad about that. We'll ask him how things are going. This is a team in transition. WHL champions in 2022. They've been, they've been really interesting this year. Yes, they have been. They've been... They, they have more wins already. They've been in already. a ton of games. Yeah. They've got, obviously, more wins, but, like, yeah. they're, the games that they've year. lost have been decided by, like, one goal or, or two goals or less quite a few times. Like, they've been in a lot of hockey games... And somehow just end up on the wrong end of the stick. I yeah, know there they, was a good stretch of that. They blew a 3 nothing lead last week in Kelowna, I believe it was. Tough go last game of a long trip with a lot of travel in Calgary to wrap that trip up. And uh, so they get Red Deer tonight, back home tomorrow. Yeah, they beat Tri-City the other day, 6-5. Beat, yes. Barn burner. Yes, 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 yes. Your old team. My old team. So K Rad will give us the scoop on the Oil Kings. We'll be great to catch up with him. Always good to give the Oil Kings some love. We've actually we've had we had Serge Lajoie on. Yeah. We've well, we had Vern Fiddler. His son Blake is in yep. Oil King. Yeah, we've uh, been yeah. dabbling around them. Yeah, we'll give them some more love. Guy Flaming has joined us. Yeah. On the station. Yeah. So we'll go there. Johnny Boychuk, late edition. Just shaved, apparently. That's great. For the phone call that he's going to be on. Does he need to shave his back? I'm going to ask him. Okay, great. Backscape. Um, And then Dave Pagnata at 1130. And, of course, uh, get in on the conversation. Nasty chat as well as the inbox, 780-218-9999. All right. 
We need to get to some business. I mentioned Backscape. They are a great partner and a great friend, and they are also the sponsors of Toe Drag Swag. We put it out there. We had four options. Uh, if you don't follow our Hello Hockey account on Twitter or X, Hello Hockey Show, follow us there, and uh, we always appreciate you voting on Toe Drag Swag. What did we have this week on Toe Drag Swag, Belzy, before YouTube pre uh, Trev shows Toe Drag Swag to everyone? Well, personally, I there was one move that I thought was going to be the runaway winner. Okay. Um, coming from the WHL. Yes. Saskatoon Blades. Yes. Um, you don't see that move done at high speed very often. I know which one you're talking about. Right. But then there's uh, Coster Dunn. Shout out to Coster Dunn. He's a uh, former Spruce Grove Saint. Actually coached him a little bit. Uh, great kid. He had an unbelievable move. This was a close vote. It really was. It really was. So I was actually very happy to see that. A little bit more interaction. Traction with some fans. It was great. Done dirty. As we Done dirty. All right. Do you want to tee it up? Do you want to play it? Yeah, let's go. All right, YouTube Trav. Let's see t the results from Toe Drag Swag and this week's uh, candidates first. All right, those were the candidates, and uh, you want to reveal the winner? Yeah, this was the closest matchup I think we've ever had. Yes. The winner is Look Ma, one hand. That was the one-hander with the Leafs. It was a beautiful move, impressive, very impressive forearm strength to be able to get that off with one hand, especially holding another guy off. Right. Very impressive stuff, but there was some good stuff there. I honestly thought Saskatoon was going to win. That was done dirty. You were done dirty? They were done dirty on they that. They were done boat. dirty. But uh, Look Ma One Hand is the winner for this week's edition of Toe Drag Swag, brought to you by the fine folks over at Backscape. If you got a hairy back, Backscape's gotcha. Uh, check them out, backscape.com, B-A-K-S-C-A-P-E. And uh, always have uh, a great starter kit special if you go to backscape.com and check them out. So uh, we'll get to... Uh, the first star of the show later, also brought to you by Backscape. Beautiful. Nicely done. I'm pretty sure Johnny's hairy. Yeah, okay. So let's... You can him. ask let's, him. I'm let's send him one. Let's send him one. All right. That uh, guy is consistently warm. You know I went to high school with him? Did you? Yeah. <laughs> he's a good dude. Yeah, he's a good dude. Although he's a couple years older. but uh, Very popular. Yeah? Very popular. Yeah. Student at yeah. Austin O'Brien High School. Well, you went to AOB, eh? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, All star game. We're getting close to that in Toronto. 32 players unveiled, and then we're waiting on the fan vote. Where are we at with that? The fan vote is, to me, is interesting because you know it's going to go one of two ways. Go on. They're either going to vote normal and get the right people in there, mm -hmm. or they're going to be donkeys like they did with Johnny Scott. Love John, T former teammate of mine, but come on. Like, it was almost a running joke. Like, let's get John Scott in the All-Star game. I was there. It was a great <laughs> It was a great experience. Was it? I'm surprised they don't have a movie out about that yet. Netflix, where are you at? So the final 12 participants will be announced Saturday, so today, mm -hmm. during the broadcast tonight. 16 games on the NHL schedule, uh, 12 skaters uh, or eight skaters and four goalies will join the 32 players selected by the league who were announced January 4th. As of midnight on Monday, the top vote getters were William Nylander and Mitch Marner. Shocking. It is in Toronto. Uh, Elias Patterson, JT Miller, and Brock Besser uh, were in the mix. Leon Dreisaitl was in there from the Oilers, Kale McCarr from the Avs, Artemi Panarin from the Rangers, and then Miko Rantanen. I'd have a hard time seeing, 
Well, I'd have a hard time with the, if none of those guys were in the All Star game. Panarin won't be because his wife is expecting their second. Yeah, that's child. a whole. That's a whole different. So Ranton yeah. gets in. Yeah, if that holds up, unless there is a change in the voting from the fans, unless they bring back Johnny Scott, they will not bring back Johnny Scott. The he's leading out of, he's goalies, out of retirement. He's retired. No, he's the leading goalie. Statcher Demko, Bobrovsky. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Swayman, and Alexander Georgiev from the Avs. Any surprises there? Alexander Georgiev from the Avs. That's <laughs> a surprise to me. <laughs> I don't think all-star when I hear Alexander Georgiev. <laughs> fair, fair enough. I mean, he is he, he's he's playing, good. He's playing, playing well. I he's mean, on a great team, yes. He's on a great team, but he's also playing well. It's like one of those things where, like, yeah, if you're on a... Who's that playing well? <laughs> I'm not doing it. Alexander Georgiev. If you're on a bad team and you got bad goaltending, well, yeah. no kidding. Yeah. It's like if you're a San Jose Shark right now, it doesn't matter what Mackenzie Blackwood does, his stats are going to suck. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've got to you've got to do well. Like, I mean, good for him. Georgiev. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. So that is going to be revealed today on the two national broadcasts. We'll find out the last 12 players Rounding out the All-Star rosters, All-Star weekend, of course, uh, coming up from February 1st to 3rd at Scotiabank Arena in Tirana. How do you think that's going to be? Like, Bieber's going to be involved. Drake's going to be involved. There's supposed to be some other celebrities there. Do you get hyped up? I think All-Star weekend, it's actually fun. Like, Pagnata usually throws a party. I think it'll be a good time. Does. Yeah. I think, like, you know, looking at just the different, different events that the NHL's done across, you know, the landscape, whether it's the winter classics or, you know, stuff overseas. This is something they try to do right. Mm-hmm. And they really, really put their, their full force, their marketing power into it. Yeah, they do. So I'm excited to see what they're going to do. Um, I think it'll be a wicked event. I wish we could go. but Maybe budget next year. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we'll have budget next year. Maybe we have a travel budget at Hello Hockey. It's Bore Edmonton. Travel Alberta. Look at you soliciting West Jet. local companies. Air Canada. Get at us. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for Morning Coffee, brought to you by the good folks at Fox Coffee. Check them out on 104th Street, two blocks south of Rogers Place. And uh, right now it's the pop-up shop as they construct the brick-and-mortar element. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, great group over there. Local coffee shop. And they uh, also do some phenomenal donuts. Yes. Allergen free, which is very, very important. It is Hello Hockey right here on Edmonton Sports Talk. Tom Gazzola, Sean Bell with you, YouTube Trev, as well as we roll along. We have a great show for you. As always, uh, we get to the first star of the show, brought to you by Backscape, fastest growing male grooming company on the market. Big sale on now, save 40% on a starter kit. So if somebody's got a hairy back, I mean, I. I don't know if you'd be shaving your back right now with how cold it is. No, you let that thing buck. Oof. And you have a double sweater. Oof. But you'll be warm. Yes. Gross, but yes. <laughs> and then as soon as it heats up to minus 19 next week. Man, hit that you know seat. what? It's going to be funny. So Edmonton's the type of place that there's some crazy people out here. You yep. know that there's going to be some guy wearing shorts at minus 19. Well, we had like, well, Troy was, come in here yesterday. Well, there you go. Ah, it was minus 40 for three days. It's warm now. You know what's going to happen. with fleece. Yeah, I've seen it happen. Yeah. It's quite outrageous. I couldn't do it. I don't, even know, I don't even know. That, that doesn't excite me at all. Yeah. No, me neither. Uh, we do have Kevin Rodomsky coming up. He will be our first star of the show. YouTube Trev is working on that. Uh, you can text us, 780-218-9999, and get at us via the nasty chat. Uh, let's see what's going on. What are you guys talking about in the nasty chat? It's uh, Reaper's in there. McFosidle's in there. Uh, Reaper says the streaks in the National Hockey League are wild. Four teams with eight or more winning streaks, and the Kings with seven straight losses. How about the Kings and their collapse? Now they're being reeled in by the Oilers and the yeah. Kraken, right? And you're even looking at the Golden Knights who've had their struggles. Yep. That's been interesting. It's there for the taking if the Oilers keep going. Knock on wood. Hopefully they can uh, 
pull that off tonight. Yeah. Uh, Max85 says, people that crap on the Oilers' management for the Broberg pick need to look at the circumstances in losing Marino. And... Uh, that's actually a good, that's an interesting. interesting comment. Because but at the time, Marino looked at the roster that the Oilers had on the back end and said, I don't like my chances here. But what I think he's also saying is the fact that the guy that was sitting there will forever be linked to the Oilers is Zegras. He was sitting right there. Yeah. And I think he went, what is it, two picks later, three picks later? Four picks later, yeah. And in time when the Oilers needed a little bit more offensive firepower, at that time they did. Yeah. So I, I guess that's why they're always bringing that up with Zegers, but like, it's a great point. Would he have actually come here? Yeah, I think so. Are you sure? I assume so. We assume we all assume so, but I mean, across the the landscape in Canada, like how many American players are actually playing consistently playing in Canada? JT Miller is a good one. That's one. Um. Connor Garland wants out of Vancouver, although <laughs> there, things there, are pretty good there. There you go. So yeah. if he if it's really good there and he wants out, well, Maybe what does he that say? His mind. Just saying, the amount of the amount of American players that have signed free agency deals in Canada in the last five years is very very small. Hannafin's in Calgary, although he's willing to leave. Yep. Uh, who else? Lewis was there, but he's gone. Yeah. Well, Caulfield in Montreal. So that's four players across. Yeah. Kyle Connor, someone says. 97. McD, 97, 97. Mm-hmm. Via Hello, the nasty chat. Yep. But those guys Hello, were all Buck. drafted. So we just threw out the comment of free agency. Free agency. And some of these guys, the minute they have the opportunity to leave, to Chuck, gone. Connor Garland, Garland wants out. Lewis, Johnny, Johnny gone. Goudreau. Goudreau, gone. Yeah. So, all these guys, like Adam Fox, gone. Max 85, good stuff. Like, it, it's just something that happens. So, it's hard to, to figure out what they're going to do. So, it's a great question of would he have actually stayed? Uh, how about this hot take from Freezer Bag who texts in and <laughs> oh, oh says, boy. no one wants Zegris. What? What do you <laughs> think of that, Belzy? <sighs> well, the rumor came out, obviously, right, where he... He's on the trade block, potentially, in, in Anaheim. Yeah. So, like, you've got this player that clearly is a rising star in the game. Mm-hmm. He can put up points. He's flashy. He's he's really, he's a very talented hockey player. But at the same time, if you were to look at him, you're like, does this guy actually love playing the game, or is he into some other stuff? There's nothing wrong with that. Sure. It's just, it's a very interesting one. Like, why would Anaheim put him on the block all of a sudden? Is there stuff behind the scenes? Well, the the negotiations and when he was signing his new contract, that was, maybe something happened there. Yeah, maybe. It's just very interesting to see how that goes, right? Yeah. Uh, we do have Kevin Rodomsky coming up. YouTube Trav is working on that. We'll get to him shortly. He's the director of business ops for the Edmonton Oil Kings. I want to get to this other text, though, sure. before we get to K-Rad. Uh, this one comes in and says, not much about torts gets young, young players excited. I, I, we did I read think this you, one you read this one, yeah. And then the follow-up was, thoughts on PWHL momentum? Oh, yeah. PWHL is great. The momentum has been, has been fantastic. It's something that, uh, that people want to see. If you're, you know, girls in the sport growing up, it's, it's one thing to obviously – Watch the NHL and, and say, hey, I want to be I want to be a hockey player. But when you literally have somebody that looks like you mm-hmm. sitting there in a pro league, that just helps spur your dreams on a little bit more. Right. So the PWHL gaining steam, gaining momentum. They broke another record last week. Fantastic to see. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, and I can I honestly hope that they can continue to build this. And it's not just something where it's a flash in the pan for let's call it a month, and then people start disappearing. They have some mega sponsors on board. Which is they? fantastic. Yeah. I think they just got UPS. Really? I think so. Wow. That is impressive. 780-218-9999. Uh, nasty chat. There's some interesting ones. Uh, Oilers and Flames ain't messing with U.S. National Development Team, although James says Jack Campbell is American. Yeah. Jack Campbell's not here. 
He's from Michigan. That's like a de- that's like a de facto Canadian place anyway. A little so, bit, right? Yeah. Uh, Max also says the tide's turning on these USND kids, in my opinion. That's from Max85. How are we looking, YouTube, Trev? I uh, yeah, I think we're I think we're good. Uh, he had to reconnect. I'm pretty sure he can hear now. I believe K Rad can hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's giving. Go. Okay, sounds him. good. Yeah, let's bring him on the show let's now. Let's get Dahmer in here. Kevin Redom. Dahmer, what's going on? Great I'll, to have you on. I'll good morning, going, pal. Yeah. Are you staying warm? What's going on? Like you're wearing short sleeves. I'm I'm wearing thermal gear and I'm indoors. Tommy, I, I don't know if you know this, but you did a phone interview with me like a year ago, right? Yes. You were still on 1260 at the time. Yes. It was Christmas time. Uh, Dusty was over at Spangler. Yep. And I realized without even noticing, I shaved before my phone interview with you because of who you are and how dapper you <laughs> always look. And I remember I was talking to Dusty and I was just like, I actually got mad at myself. I was just like, I could have like dialed this thing with a hoodie, no socks. Right. I got all dressed up because it was Tommy G, right? So, oh my God. Sean Valley, nice to see you, brother. <laughs> Good seeing you too, man. <laughs> I did you see? Did you shave this time? You know what? Look at this. No, fresh. No, oh. we're, we're crazy. Oh. We're, we're all over the road. You're an ageless wonder, Kara. That's I mean, and you always have great energy too. That's what we appreciate. And I'm glad we could have you on camera today and at our new station because it's been. It's been a fun foray, and it gives people another uh, way to another medium to to see and connect with us and and with our uh, guests as well. So this is good. So you know what? It's fine that you didn't shave today. I'm not offended, and I didn't know that you shaved for your radio interview with me about a year ago. But that's it how good of a guy you are. Well, it says a little bit about my intelligence right there. But, hey, all good, all good. No, 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 no. You're sharp. You're razor sharp. Uh, all right. It is the first star of the show brought to you by Backscape. And uh, he is Kevin Radomski, Director of Business Operations for the Edmonton Oil Kings. They're in action tonight. And then they're back home tomorrow. And we're going to get to that theme night as well because I love it. Actually, it's tomorrow afternoon. Tonight is in Red Deer. Uh, okay, k Rad, let's talk about this team because, you know, last year was tough, but you knew – it will probably be like that for the team coming off the cha- WHL championship two years ago. There's that cycle in junior hockey. We all know that. Belzy yep. knows it. I know it. You know it. You've been around uh, junior hockey for a long time. This is your second go around with the Oil Kings. You've been with the Oilers for a long time as well. You did Hockey Canada stuff. But right now, 14 22, 1 and 1, going into the back half of the year. It's four more wins than last year. So, you know, if you're looking at positive silver linings, that's one. And is it a great one? Uh, you know, debatable, subjective, but it is better than last year. So how would you describe the first half of the season and what are the team's goals going into the back half here? Yeah, you know what, like, like for those who don't know, and you, you summarized it really well, Tom, like that's junior hockey, right? So our players, they age out. Uh, we're really blessed with our president and general manager, Kurt Hill. I think he does a tremendous job. I suppose if he didn't do a great job, I probably wouldn't say he's not doing a great job on this show. But I, I honestly believe that he does a great job. He's not content. Mm. And in not being content of being like, sometimes in some teams, close enough is good enough. And with Kurt, he's always out there saying, I think we can upgrade here. I think we can upgrade there. To your point, we won 10 games last year. Yep. It shouldn't be lost on anything that our 10th win came on our last game of the year in Calgary. And at home, we won four games. We play 34 games at home, which means that our fans, 30 nights, went home without two points in their pocket. And so for us, we knew that the growth and the development of our players was going to continue. That's the beauty of junior hockey. You see these raw assets that these players are coming in, and you watch them grow, both as players and as men. And this year, you know, we've done a great job in stepping forward. This team isn't pushed around easily. When Kurt went out and got a local product from St. Albert, Mark Lajwa, you know, he's, he's our D-man, 6'6", 220, as a 20-year-old. I can't describe how much Mark has changed our back end in just the calm, the poise, and, of course, the physicality yeah. of a guy who's 6'6". It doesn't take much for him to really exert himself onto the uh, into the game sheet, not necessarily points and assists, which he's doing a tremendous job on, but just that physicality. And I think what we've seen more than anything is that this team is tenacious. Yep. And we we can come back from uh, down goals where we thought we maybe couldn't. And, and we're still young, though. You know, and you could see it when we were playing in Kelowna coming off our road trip. We were up 3 nothing, feeling good. And we dropped, we dropped the game 4-3. And so those things still happen. 
But, you know, you take a look at our, our game on uh, on Thursday night, minus 40 outside. We had a great crowd inside Rogers Place. And again, we thought we were in command and, you know, we were up 3 nothing, And then all of a sudden, Tri-City comes back. Okay. And it was a one-goal game. It was a 6-5 WHL classic finish. But I can tell you that the fans are really getting a great entertainment value on the ice. And, of course, you know, we saw that the NHL Central Scouting released uh, their top picks and their players to watch, and four of the Oil Kings were on that list. Yeah, no, they've uh, – the Oil Kings have definitely started to the, turn that corner. Yes. Um, Lajoie definitely is a, is a key piece of that. I'm sure he probably bullies his dad on the bench, but that's a different conversation. I heard it's a good dynamic. I was talking to Rogan. He's like, it works yeah, really I'm, well. I'm sure it right? is, yeah. yeah. Mark, Mark's a fantastic kid, but – one of the things that I've noticed here in the past couple of weeks is you guys have made some trades. Uh, Ishmael Abagush here, the, what yeah. was it, about well, two days ago. Uh, yep. Grayson Sachin uh, earlier in the month or last month, actually. Um, is this just something that Kurt Hill looked at and said, hey, there's these players that are available that fit our window, and we want to try to accelerate our cycle? Yeah. And that you couldn't have said it better, Sean. That's exactly what it is. And again, that comes back to that the, the tenacity on the ice comes from our general manager and president. And you know, and we, we send some really good people out. Like you're not going to get good unless you give good. Like 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 that's that cycle of every sport. If you want to get some asset, you're going to have to give up some asset. Mm-hmm. In order to get someone like a Tomasek, we had to give up like uh, Ronald Kavasovic and Wojtek Port, which were great players. And you never you never say to yourself. Well, we don't want to just keep them because they're really good. We think that we can upgrade. And with Ismail, uh, he's coming to us from Lac La Biche, and and he's uh, of a demographic that isn't usually rep- recognized or represented in hockey. So I can tell you that the Muslim community with Abagush is excited. The northern Alberta of uh, Lac La Biche is excited. You put those two things together. The guy who sells tickets goes and hugs the GM and says, thanks so much for giving me people that I, I can market and people that I can use in the game to showcase just, just how great it is to play at Edmonton. And like, hey, uh, Abagush was coming from Kelowna. I don't know if he's happy about the weather right now, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, we have to apologize. Like when we traded Carter Kowalik to Kelowna, it's one of those, you know, hey, Wally, thanks for everything. Great kid. And I think he's doing a little better than minus 41 right now in Kelowna. Mm-hmm. But uh, but that's the whole thing is is like everything kind of comes together. And when we traded Nathan Pilling, you know, Nathan Pilling, you know, like from Calgary, but obviously grandson of champion for the Edmonton Oil Kings, Greg Pilling. Yes. And, and like, you know, and that was not an easy trade. But then you take a look at Sochin. And of course, he's got a younger brother that yep. if his younger brother plays as well, like then, you know, like that's a great trade for us. And you can see what Grayson's added to our team instantly and it's never easy for these young kids to join on a long road trip we started in prince george on december 27th winding through victoria vancouver down to everett for fun kamloops Kelowna, calgary and that was his introduction to his teammates what a great way to to really build and develop on the road kevin rodomsky joining us now director of business ops for the edmonton oil kings they're in action tonight in red deer back in action tomorrow afternoon at home uh that's a four o'clock start and uh there's some stuff we're going to talk to you about that which i'm excited about i was listening to a little suspicious minds this morning that's a little bit of a a little bit of a hint that's a teaser that's a yeah. nice little <laughs> teaser yeah a little foreshadowing there but uh k-rad when you came back to the oil kings i know you know this is a time of transition you're, you're working alongside kurt hill luke pierce trying to get this team back in the win column as much as possible but what were some of the challenges that excited you about coming back, uh, working with the Oil Kings, making it a, a championship caliber franchise again? And and how has this uh, go around been for you thus far? I, I got to tell you, like, like I, I would say this as honestly as I could. If, if people aren't familiar with junior hockey, it's just, it's so special. There's nothing else like it in the fact that we get these young men, you know, like, you, know you look at a guy like Joe Ginla, 15 years old, well, we hope to have Joe Ginla until he's a 20-year-old. And the difference in, in, in the development personally, emotionally, on the ice, off the ice, it's so neat to watch uh, these young men really find their way. And like I remember when we had Aaron Irving as our captain all playing over in Europe. And when you looked at his draft photo, he was just a baby. <laughs> and when, when and when we traded him away in his 20, 20 year old year with our then GM Randy Hanch, like you get emotional because like you know them, you know their families. 
And that was my biggest attraction to come back to the Oil Kings is I, I simply loved it. Oilers Entertainment Group, I, I moved within the Oilers Entertainment Group away from the Oil King file and onto the Rogers Place file, which then became the Hockey Canada file with the World Juniors for the first of three. But uh, I never <laughs> lost my love for junior hockey. Right. And when it was when I was when I was approached to return to junior hockey, it, it wasn't anything I had to think about. I love it. And the challenge is, is that if you follow my career, I've never had a championship team. I started running this team in 2014 after we won the Memorial Cup. Yes. We had we had the slide down, which is normal. And right when I left, they won again. So maybe it's me. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but whoever comes in after me is probably going to have a whole bunch of rings on their finger, but I haven't gotten any yet. But uh, it's just, it's so much fun. And, and I got to be honest, like like working with Kurt Hill, working with Luke Pierce, you know, Kyle Chipchura as our assistant coach, Lai mm-hmm. Smead as our development coach, you know, David Peltier is our skating coach. Like we walk into the, into the dressing room, you've got tremendous players in the locker room and the coach's office, the trainer, Rogan Dean, been there since day one, 2007. Yeah. Like there's just, it's a family. And it just it feels so good just to be part of that family. And we're blessed. We're blessed to be owned by the Oilers organization. We're blessed to be able to play out of Rogers Place. And, and like there's nowhere else I would rather be. If any other team offered me more money, I'd decline it because I love where I am and I love who I work for. I love that. A lot of great characters like Kevin oh. just uh, pointed out. And yeah. and Kurt Hill, even talking to him when I just run, run into him at the rink, Kev, like you could tell there's a determination and he wants yeah. to have a friendly chat with you. But then you're like, Man, Kurt's uh, Kurt's working on something. There's something yeah. going yeah. on. He's and, sharp. Yeah, very, very sharp. So you, tons of great people, and the attitude's right. And when smart people that are all work, working together uh, come together, usually there is success that uh, comes from it. Go ahead, Belzy. Yeah, you know I just want, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, like what I love, and, and then junior hockey, most times, the people running the team were players. Mm-hmm. But then I'm able to talk to Kurt Hill, you know, former player, you know, like, like I can talk to him on a different level of, hey, what do you think about this? Or, hey, what do you think about that? And there's, he's not that far removed, right? Like, like yeah. we forget just, just, you know, like he went through the system and uh, I'm able to talk to him as a general manager and an architect, but I can also like pick his brain as a former player. What would you think if we tried this or did that? And it's such a, it's such a benefit for me to be able to talk to the many hats of Kurt Hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, very well said. Uh, I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on, on something that's happened in the WHL. Uh, I would say probably, within the last three years um, before we kind of get to a more fun question with, with Tom, but um, I like fun (laughs) recently, the, the WHL you've seen more trades than ever. Um, The trades that are happening now are, you know, last year there was Olin Zellweger for here's a Brinks truck. Um, You know, across the league, it's been going that way. Is this something that we're seeing more in the WHL now because they're trying to load these teams up so that they have a chance to win in the Memorial Cup? Is this something that you're seeing in the WHL because they want to, you know, counter what the QMJHL is doing or what the OHL is doing because they're doing very similar things? I know the Q has done it since I played. Um, you just, you don't see it in the WHL. So I just wanted to, to kind of get your thoughts on on why that's all of a sudden exploded uh, in in that world. Yeah, you know, and it's a great question because you are right. In the last few years, the the makeup and the composition of trade seems to have, have shifted. Um, you are right. There's a lot more blockbusters every year. And, and for, for where we're at right now, and I'll speak for Kurt, hopefully I hit the head here, <laughs> but it's it's always nice to be a seller when people are paying crazy prices uh, for, for basically the talent. I think a lot more teams nowadays, they want to do that 360 development where they want players in their system. They, and especially for us, we want those players that we can watch their development, we can monitor them, we can influence their off-ice training or what have you, mm-hmm. so that when they get called up to us, there's a familiarity with our program and they can hit the ground running. I think that what you're seeing is with a lot more draft picks, teams are so much more focused than ever on the horizon rather than the actual sun. And, and I think that that's what you're seeing a lot of teams building towards. But you are right, Sean. Like the amount of players that are put into trades uh, has never been higher since my, my time in the WHL. Like the one-for-one deals seem to be gone. Yeah. Um, yep. But I do think that you are right. I think uh, you're seeing that like teams that win, I don't care if it's in the NHL, the WHL, the Q, the O, whatever, 
that depth of organization. If you take a look at our start to the year, like I, again, I'm going to speak for, for uh, my own thoughts and, and I hope I don't offend anyone, but I think it would have been really hard for Kurt Hill to assess his team when half of our team was in the sick bay. Yeah. And yeah. we had long-term injuries. Like these guys weren't out with nicks and scrapes. They were out with long-term injuries. And Jimmy McKnight, our athletic therapist, he was the busiest guy going because, you know, and we were forever calling up players that were playing beyond their capacity because of injury. Well, the reason that our road trip turned around is we started getting bodies back. And instead of like usually those long road trips, they're the ones that sink you where you, you get, you know, an injury in night one. And Sean, you remember how it is as you're, as you're nursing an injury, you'll always get another one. It always seems. And we were able to stay relatively healthy on that road trip, but more than anything, we got bodies back. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I think with our organizational depth that we've had through our development and through our drafting, you're able to call up the Joe Aginlas of the world, give him a little look. We can assess where he's at. And then when we send him back, we send him back with knowledge of, hey, Joe, we love what you're doing here. We'd love you to, to, to work on that. Or you, know, you look at like our goalie, Perry from Grand Prairie Storm, same idea. He got called up basically like, as an emergency basis. We needed him and we needed him to play. And now all of a sudden now he's, he's with us for the rest of the year. Yeah. Uh, exciting stuff uh, off the ice, uh, trades, all of that, the young players coming up the pipeline. And then uh, there are the things that you do in-house, Kev, and, and this is something that's excellent. It uh, creates a fun environment for families to get down to the big rink. Doesn't break the bank as well. I think that's something that uh, is top of mind, and you get some excellent value in what you're watching. Great entertainment on the ice from the team as well. Uh, tomorrow it is uh, the Elvis afternoon, and uh, yep. tell us what fans that are going down to Rogers Place are going to get, and then the other theme nights that you guys have for the rest of the year because this is something that uh, we see the, the billboards and the ads for, and it's like, you know what? That'll be pretty fun. Yeah, and thanks for the great setup, Tommy. Like, again, if you haven't been to an Oil King game, the whole thing is built on great value. We, we promise that you're going to have three periods of thrilling WHL hockey. That's a promise. But what we'll give you in exchange is we're gonna we're not going to hit you too hard, right? So yep. junior hockey is all about the families coming out. And like, hey, let, let's say it's straight. Like, it's hard for a family of four to do anything, whether it be going to a movie, whether it be going to a sporting event, or just trying to, like, downhill ski. I don't care right. what it is. Everybody's got their hand out, and we're all the same, right? We buy a bag of apples for $10, and there's two apples in the bag. It gets hard. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, like, I, I tell the joke where you remember back in the old days when we were younger, you know, you'd walk around, you know, big gold chains around your neck. And that's how you showed everybody, hey, I yeah. got money. Well, now you can walk around with a bag of fruit and people are like, holy smokes, that, that guy's doing really well. Like, he's, he's got great like, Come on. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. honestly. But uh, what we wanted to make sure of more than anything is that the families that come out, you know, great seats at Rogers Place, like one of the best buildings in all of North America. Yes. Great seats start at $20. And then we challenged ourselves this year. We said, okay, great that we, we've established the great value that you're going to get when you buy your ticket, but we want to go a little further so that when you get here, you know, there's an opportunity for families to have fun and still not break the bank. And so we introduced some kids food combos this year yes. where there's eight, eight kids food combos that are $10 or less. And we're talking about the stuff kids want to eat. It's hot dogs, it's hamburgers, it's uh, slices of pizza, popcorn and soda. And like they're as low as seven fifty, no more than ten dollars. And we really wanted to challenge ourselves. And it's hard. It's it's. I won't lie to you. Like it's not easy to go back to our culinary team and say, "I love what you're doing." Mm -hmm. And uh, we we've been able to do that. We've seen great success this year. And then you layer on the theme nights, like we have tomorrow afternoon. We have an Elvis impersonator coming up from Calgary, <laughs> and he he's not one of those guys that slaps on a wig and. For three minutes a day, he becomes Elvis Presley. The guy's got his own chops going on. Like, he's the real deal that way. Oh, boy. And if you if you look into uh, the promotional side, like, like, to me, it's all about having fun. And, again, that relationship I have with Kurt and the team, I'm able to say, hey, guys, if all we sell is hockey, then we live and die by You guys can't lose a game then. If that's right. all we're going to do, right? Like, I need 34 wins at home, please. <laughs> um, but we, we don't, right? So the hockey is a, like, we are a hockey team, but then we want to make it fun. So tomorrow afternoon, 
You know, three o'clock is when the door is open. Family friendly, four o'clock start time. You know, families you'll be out the door by six thirty. For all those kids listening, you'll still be uh, at home in time to finish your homework and do all your Sunday routine to get ready for <laughs> Monday school. Sorry. But um, and we're also going to give away a thousand pairs of Elvis sunglasses, complete with sideburns. They look ridiculous. Nice. <laughs> when you put them on, you feel the part. And yeah, we're going to have Elvis Presley in the stands, kind of thing. He's going to be shucking and jiving, and it's going to be a ton of fun. And the whole thing is all about that family entertainment. Yep. Uh, Twenty bucks to get in the door. Those kids combos. You're talking about pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Those are things I want to eat, Kev, at 38 years old. But uh, that's just me. <laughs> and then uh, Elvis afternoon. Great music, timeless, classic. Everybody can love a, a good Elvis tune. And uh, the most important thing, maybe two points for the Oil Kings. Uh, yeah. Hopefully against the Spokane Chiefs. K. Rad, you know what? Always great to see you. I knew this would be perfect to get you in and to pump up the team because uh, we want to see success on and off the ice for the team and for yourself and Kurt Hill and Rogan Dean and Luke Pearson and all of the fantastic people at the Oil Kings. So as always, my friend, thank you. And I know I'll see you soon. And Belzy and I are going to have to come to a game and yes, uh, join you. Yeah. Honestly, thank you for the opportunity. Sean, awesome to see you. I, I get to bump into the handsome Tom Gazzola backstage oh, now stop and then. It. But yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I do. I appreciate the opportunity. You guys are killing the podcast. Sounds great. And we just appreciate always uh, the invitation and can't wait to see you at the rink. Awesome. Kevin Radomski, Director of Business Ops for the Edmonton Oil Kings, taking on the Red Deer Rebels tonight in Red Deer. And then it will be the Spokane Chiefs tomorrow afternoon, 4 o'clock puck drop. You heard Kev say it, 3 o'clock, the doors open. It is an Elvis afternoon. First thousand fans through the door get the sunglasses with the sidebirds. You've got the impersonator coming up from Calgary who lives, breathes, eats, sleeps. <laughs> Elvis, evidently, because he's got the... There's no wig. There's no wig. It's That's legit. And, uh, and then maybe the All Kings can pick up their 15th, potentially 16th win of the season tomorrow. Uh, we'll see what happens tonight in Red Deer. That was our first star of the show. It was Kevin Radomski, Director of Business Operations for the Edmonton Oil Kings, uh, first star of the show, brought to you by the good folks at Backscape, fastest growing male grooming company on the market. They do have a big sale, save 40% on a starter kit. All right, we are going to move into our number two as we get in the game here on Hello Hockey on Edmonton Sports Talk. Tom Gazzola, Sean Bell, YouTube Trev with you. You can text us 780-218-9999, or you can also hit us up in the nasty chat if you're watching on the EST YouTube channel. Of course, portions of this hour brought to you by the good folks at Local Public Eatery, where you can enjoy the best late-night happy hours. A great spot to check out all of the NFL action going on this weekend, and uh, as well as 16 games on the NHL schedule tonight. Uh, and our buddy Dean Lowry over at Local will have 6 o'clock or logger on tap and soon. Well, very soon. Big very thank soon. you to Sonny Varma as well, too. Absolutely. So, all right, uh, let's roll into our next guest. He's ready to go. Edmonton product, Johnny Boychuk. And man, that needs backscape for sure, Johnny Boychuk. Johnny, uh, hello, good morning. And uh, I I don't know if you need a backscape. It's he a does. fantastic grooming tool. I don't recall seeing if you have a hairy back or not. I didn't look for it, but uh, could you use a backscape? Because Belzy wants to send you one. Nah, Belzy just wants the hair trimmings, creep. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Johnny. Just just be honest here, buddy. You've got a wool sweater on right now. Oh, of course. It's minus 40 here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is minus 40 here. Uh, are you back in the city? How long have you been back for? And uh, when are you flying back out? Uh, I've been back uh, mid-December, and I'll probably fly out uh Probably the 21st, I'm thinking, of January to go back to New York and Bridgeport. So when you're on your, your scouting trips or your development trips, what uh, can you just give a, a little glimpse into what the day in life of Johnny Boychuk looks like? Um, usually, like, uh, I'll, I'll be staying. I, I usually spend about five days in Bridgeport or four or five. It's, it all depends on, like, the scheduling and then uh, – I'll be in Bridgeport for the time that I'm there and go to the rink 
go on the ice with the, the team, go work with the defenseman, and then uh, just try to see how they're doing. And like, if I see anything in their game or what they need to work on, uh, tendencies, uh, you know, like for defensemen, it's like box outs or uh, stick positioning, like different little tricks that, you know, that like as a defenseman, you wouldn't really think of. Mm-hmm. But I try to show little things to try to implement them to make it easier for them when they're either going against the big guy or they need help with positioning in front of the net. That's more or less what I do. Whatever I taught myself to do, I try to help them out by, you know, if if they can do it, then I try to show them the way how to do it. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Boychuk joining us yeah. now in player development with the New York Islanders. And, and Johnny, I was going to throw this at you because it's not like you've been out of the game for very long. It's only been a, a handful of years now. Are you noticing with some of these younger guys and you're going to Bridgeport, you're working with the Islanders prospects, like the skill and how much it's evolving and the speed of these guys and their ability to do stuff so, so quickly, turn on a dime. I mean, compared to when you broke into the NHL to now with these young guys, uh, how, do, how do you look at the, the level of talent with these players? It's, I mean, the level of talent is tremendous, but the thing I've noticed is the, uh, there's so much skill that it's almost a detriment, kind of, where hockey, hockey sense doesn't, is sometimes not there. Whereas when we were growing up and breaking into the league, there was a lot more hockey sense that I feel, but the skill level wasn't as good. Right. So the speed, the speed of the game is way faster. Like, I mean, it's tremendously fast where I'm glad that I'm not playing because I'd probably be on a lot of high leg reels. <laughs> so, uh, of the skill, like you, you see these guys with all their skill and the, they're like, they can pass the puck like none other. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit different in a way where the skill and the speed is taking over and it's just being playing as fast as you can. Sometimes, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad though. Mm-hmm. In regard to if that, that makes sense. No, I know exactly because <laughs> no, as soon as you said that, I'm like, yep. I know, I know what he means, and I want to, I want to help articulate that. And I, I uh, Belzy and I on this show over the last, I think, three or four weeks, we've talked about one topic: is it's guys getting hit from behind and guys turning into hits from behind, and that's something that I think is is yep. newer. Would that be an element of the hockey sense? kind of being secondary to just the pure raw skill and the dirty dangling and all of that is, is am I on the right path when I say that? I think you might be onto something with that because when you see a guy coming to hit you, when I was, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get hit. Yeah. I'm going to make sure that my body's in a position where I'm not going to hit my head or, you know, get hit from behind. So I'm going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. But now they try to, to, I don't know, spin off or not get hit, and then it actually hurts them right. because they're they're trying to, to miss the check, and then sometimes you might get clipped, and then you're going to be in a vulnerable position where you're going to get hurt, and it's going to be way worse than just embracing the check. Yeah. I, I, I want to yeah. follow up on that. I just want to follow up on that. So, yeah, you're, you're – you're, dealing with these guys you're on the ice with them and are there have you had moments when you're, you're trying to teach them uh or or implement more hockey sense um and and do you find it, it can be frustrating or are they pretty receptive to it and do they get it right away or are you kind of like racking your mind going how do you not know this i feel like it there might be a a, a it might be hard is it hard to teach hockey sense i suppose is what i'm saying at the end of the question um, not, it, it, it is, but it isn't because like, um, if you put it into terms that they understand, like not trying to get too technical, just breaking it down as simple as possible, they do, but and then when you watch them and they try to do it and then you have to correct them again and then 
be like, okay, this is not really like, I know what you're trying to do, but you kind of look silly. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, like you have to, you have to like talk to them and, you know, first off you have to talk to them like, like a, a person, right? You can't, can't demean people. Like I never would want to do that right? because it's, it's not a character and it's, and if you, and if you want to get through to somebody, you have, you have to actually talk to them how you would want to be talked to. And connect, right? So, yep. yes, you have to have a connection because if you don't have a connection with these players or talk to them like a friend or an a, a, a actual like person, yep. then they will not listen. And I wouldn't listen to them either if they were talking to me in a not the way that I talk to people, right. but like if somebody was kind of demeaning, I don't know if that's the word, but you yeah, know what I'm trying to say. Whatever, like, yeah. The way that you used to get talked to when you were a young guy. Right. Cause everybody was yeah. old school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. But you want to be their, their friend, So they will trust you because you want to be their friend because you want to see them do good. Yeah. You want to see them succeed. You want to see them get better. You want to see them make it to the NHL. Cause at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants to do is make it to the NHL. And if you can help somebody accomplish their goal, then you've done your job. Yeah. That's very well said. Probably some fulfillment with that. I would say. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, Johnny, Absolutely. just, just like, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Finish your statement. Cause, Cause I was, I was going to get to the point where when I was, when we were breaking in, there was not a lot of communication with former players to either defensemen or forwards to, to tell them what exactly they want, what exactly that they need to do to get to the NHL. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more player development guys now that have played in the NHL and that they're trying to help these younger guys. Cause when we were breaking in me and Sean, there was nobody like you had to go out there. The only person you could really ask is your coach. And sometimes you didn't really want to ask him cause you didn't want to get in trouble or, <laughs> uh, um, you didn't look stupid. Right. But when you have guys that are your friends that were, I don't know if you call it friends, but people that you can trust yep. and that yep. you can ask, Hey, why is this getting called up? What do I need to do? Uh, what what should I do better to make it to the NHL to get to that next level? What can I do? How can I do it? Like they're very receptive on what they want and what they need to do to get to the next level, and that's a big thing now with these player development people. They actually need them because when we were when we were coming up, we had nobody. We had to basically. Uh, think about what we had to do instead of getting told what exactly we needed to work on. Oh, a hundred percent. AKA they tried to put Johnny yeah. Boychuk as a forward. They tried to turn him into a forward. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, they, they tried to turn yeah. me into forward. Kevin Constantine tried to turn me into forward at one point. Well, you, you, so. you were so smooth. You were head and shoulders above all of us. Johnny was a couple years older than me, but I do remember skating with Johnny in the summers with the other junior guys, and he was already in the pros. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just to me, I, I know exactly what you're saying, Johnny, and it's just uh, it, it's good to see guys that are that are able to help these players in, you know, get to that next level by being able to communicate properly. Um, so that's why you're seeing a lot more guys make it to the NHL. They're clearly – more polished than they've ever been. Um, so it's obviously a testament to guys like you. Um, but I do want to shift gears because at one point we talked about, you know, rivalries in the NHL and are they uh, as bitter as they used to? You were in a position as a player um, where you were part of one of the bigger rivalries in hockey um, at a time where things got pretty bitter. Um, I just wanted to see if you're interested in sharing some thoughts about it. Um, what was that like being a part of that Montreal-Boston uh, rivalry? Obviously, you guys were the big, bad Bruins. They were the small, yeah. fast Canadians um, with some annoying players. Um, yeah, yeah, please tell. I mean, there's... I don't know when 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 you when you talk about rivalries like Boston and, and Montreal are like one of the the most the, the biggest rivalries totally. I think yeah. in the NHL. It goes back for 
decades. So, yes. I mean, when we were playing them, we did not want to lose to them. We did not want to get pushed around. Obviously, we didn't get pushed around because we were a lot bigger and tougher than them, but they were they were very fast. So when you, it still, it still gives you tingles when you think about going into Montreal and you hear them come on the ice when you're on the ice. You're like, oh mm-hmm. boy, yeah. like this place is just phenomenal. When you step on the ice, and you hear the Montreal announcer yep. announce their team, and they play that U2 song, I yeah, think it yep, is. Yep. You're just, it, it gives you tingles up your neck, and then you're like, okay, it's go time, because you have to be ready for these games. It's just, like, it even give, gives me tingles right now, thinking about, <laughs> like, being on ice and listening to that 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 French guy talk on the on intercom or whatever you want to yeah. call it. Yeah, he's got just, a crazy voice. And then, yeah, and just with the roar of the crowd, it's just one of those places where you, if you're on Boston and you're going into Montreal, you better be ready because they're going to be coming straight at you. And we, for the most part, were. And it was always fun to play against them, but you always wanted to beat them because they were our rival, and they wanted to beat us. Don't don't kid yourself. Uh, yeah, hundred percent they did. One of those where where you it you, your senses get heightened, kind of like playoffs, mm-hmm. even though it's regular season where you go there and it means it means more than just two points to beat them. Mm-hmm. So. If you look back on that rivalry and in all the games that happened, was was it the powder keg essentially PK in just the way that he played? Because I know that obviously in one of his first games he gets called up, he he blows up Marchand um, just inside the the Habs blue line, um, doesn't accept the fights from multiple guys. Is he kind of the lightning rod that that sparked everything? Because let's be honest, there's a rivalry. At that time, it was still a transition era. There was like guys that were super heavyweights that are now transitioning yeah. to kind of what the game is today. But previous to PK getting there, those games never got to that level uh, or that, that no. temperature. So was it, he kind of the guy yeah, that I, sparked everything? Or was this just a case of, it, hey, we're the big bad Bruins and we're not going, <laughs> we're not going down to anybody? No, I think he did spark it uh, and, and add fuel to the fire. Like, there was always a rivalry, but when when we would play and he'd be on the ice, every, like, you know, before the before the face-offs, he'd always be doing his crossovers and turns <laughs> and stuff. What is this idiot doing? <laughs> but he, he, he was such a, uh, a personality and... He could get under your skin, but I didn't. Cr- he would never cross the line. Like he would always try to goat you into getting a penalty, yeah. which he did very well. And he would. He was such a good player for Montreal. Like it's too bad that he left Montreal because yep. he was such a good player for them. And you could see once he did leave Montreal, it kind of went a little bit downhill for him. And mm-hmm. I'm sure he wished he would have stayed there, but he did. Um, increase the rivalry to put the fuel on the fire because everybody just watched him and was annoyed <laughs> and wanted to hit him, but you, you could never hit him. But then he would hit somebody and then somebody would try to go after him and he wouldn't drop the gloves and everybody's like, come on. And then he would drop the gloves against Marchand. Like, <laughs> really? Like, come on, man. Like, you could pick anybody on our team. <laughs> you pick Marchand. Like, yeah, but, you know what? Uh, that was that, that. That's part of the thing where you know then then it made you even made you even more mad because then you'd have you'd want to go after him and then he wouldn't want to he wouldn't want to fight you. Yeah, and then so, poor Commissaric I mean, had to deal with Lucic every night. Oh my god! Yeah, I know exactly. And then like it's just added fuel to the fire. But he was such a good player for them, and it made it more interesting that's for sure whenever we did play because he was such a dominant player where he could skate the puck he could shoot the puck he was on the power play and when he scored 
you know, he did his celebrations and it would just be like, oh, come on, like, why did we have to let this guy score? <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you think back into your career and you look at all the different cities yep. and, and based off of, you know, this fan bases and was there ever a player that you thought was like tailor made for a city? Oh, interesting. If you, if you understand what I'm I saying. Mean, I mean, you got Mooch yep. with Boston. Yeah. That was, that's a no brainer. I mean, PK from Montreal. Mm-hmm. That's another one. I mean, just talked about him. Um, who else? What about Lundquist in Lindstrom, New York? Lindstrom, Lindstrom for Detroit. Yeah. Yep. Why that one? Um, just out of curiosity. Because I just, I just loved to watch him play. I, uh, and I didn't like playing against him because even though you try, like the Fords would try to chip it behind him and go get the puck, he would bat it out of the air or he would go into the corner and he would have the puck and somebody would try to hit him. He'd pass the puck and just smoothly skate around the guy. And he was just a player that was just next level, I guess, as a D-man back yes, then. Yes, yep. um, Scott Stevens for uh, Jersey. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, there's just, I don't know, there's there's a lot of them. I mean, even even Datsuk for Detroit. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. He's unreal. I do remember one time being in front of the net, I think I was with, uh, I think it was with actually Montreal at the time, we played against Detroit, and I'm in front of the net battling yeah. with Holmstrom, and I'm looking up the ice. Lindstrom's got the puck at the point, and he's walking the blue line, and we're, like, literally staring at each other in the eyes. I'm like, I've never seen a guy be able to walk the line better without looking at the puck than this guy. And it's like, okay, well, if this guy moves to the left, I'm shooting it over here. If he moves to the right, I'm shooting it yeah. over here. And somehow, some way, I've cross-checked Holmstrom 15 times, but he's still going to tip this puck into the net. It's so I 100% yeah, agree with that cool. assessment on, on Lindstrom. So annoying to play against guys that just <laughs> and just get stay in front and get just hammered on, and then all of a sudden you think you got him and he tips the puck. It's like Jesus, and then you get back to the bench and then the, the coach taps you on the shoulder and you're like, "Yeah, I know." Like I I was trying. Yeah, you guys, just losing it on you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Johnny, I have a I have a and question for you. you. Oh yeah, sorry. I have a question and for you. And then you get benched. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe this is a more pleasant memory uh, than getting benched <laughs> after a guy that you cross check still tipped one home. Uh, when you guys won yep. the cup with Boston in Vancouver and the riots happened, I like I talked yep. to Andrew Ference a bit when he was with the Oilers and we were, you know, I was traveling with the team and and I was like, hey, what what happened? He's like, we had to get the hell out of the city so fast. Is that true? Like, what no. happened when you guys won it, and, and how was that celebration? Because it, it, you couldn't have a traditional oh, celebration, remember. right? No, we actually. I think it's when we got into the uh, when we got into the dressing room. Like, all the family and friends were in there, and then uh, they left about an hour and a half later. And then I think we stayed in the dressing room for a little bit longer to because we couldn't get out. Right, there's people riding. Side. So we waited for quite a while until everything died out, and then we went home. And oh. then we got, I think we got back to Boston at like 7 in the morning or something like that, even though I think, if I recall, it was an afternoon game. Yeah, I it might have been. been. I think it was a weekend, right? Yeah, it was a weekend, like a 4 o'clock game? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that was nuts. That was absolutely nuts. Um, I know, my, my parents and my brothers my brothers and my wife were there too. And I mean, they, they stayed in Vancouver cause they, uh, they flew back to Edmonton, but my wife flew back with all the other family that went on the plane from Boston. They went back to Boston that night too. Wow, man. Like that was, that was insane. How Vancouver just rioted like that. I have one more for you. You talking about Montreal and I remember covering my first game there. I'm like, this is the arena. This is it. Like, it's like a, it's like going yeah. to church for hockey, basically. Oh yeah. And and you talked about yeah. like when they get announced, when they come out to the U two song, and their PA announcer does the lineup, and what it was like to be a Bruin waiting for that 
Habs team to come out. What stacked up better for uh, an experience? Was it in Montreal pregame, or was it Chicago Anthem? And I'll throw a last another one at you that came in just a few years ago. Vegas pregame. Of those three, which ones gives you the tingle or the goosebumps when, when you think back to? I mean, my, my, Montreal for sure mm-hmm. is number one. I would say Chicago is number two and three is Vegas because I only played in Vegas like two, maybe three times. But I just think that like with the anthem in Chicago when everybody's just belting it out, yeah. that Clapping. is amazing. Yeah. yeah, and it's just like, oh boy. Yeah. Like it just those two don't, don't, I don't even think it compares to the Vegas. You I don't I would say uh Montreal and Chicago are like 1A and B yeah. and then you got number 2 Vegas. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Vegas is like a nightclub with a medieval times show, right? Well, like, and I think and I think that's what it is, right? Yeah. Because if you think about the the other two, it's purely fan. Yeah. Right, like the you come out as the Bruins and you are getting booed beyond belief. Like you can't even hear yourself think. Yeah. On the flip side, you know Chicago and that that the anthem singer. He's got kind of that opera voice, but it's like a little bit deeper. He's seven feet tall, and too. people are losing their minds. There's clapping. There's like lights going off. There's cell phones that are that are the the flashlights on. Yeah. It just it's so surreal. So. That's kind of what I would see. I would see too, um, and, and I'm assuming that's what your your point is there, Johnny. Yeah, and then and then it's also like the original six teams. Yeah. So it's a little bit different than a team that just came into the league. They're, I mean, they're still unbelievable hockey team, but yeah. like the the uh, heritage of the original six teams and the the rivalries, even though sometimes we don't play Detroit or Chicago as many times, but there's still pride in an original six team. Totally. Yep. Johnny, thank you for taking us down memory lane. Thank you for sharing your experiences on the development side of the game as it continues to change. And I uh, always appreciate your time. Hopefully catch you on a golf course this summer and, and hop on the show again anytime you want to. Not at Northern Bear, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, awful. I saw the Twitter. <laughs> yeah. That's bad. That, that is not good. No. Um, yeah, but <laughs> sorry about that one. <laughs> <laughs> we want good vibes, Johnny. <laughs> good vibes. <laughs> well, thanks, guys, for having me. Uh, you know, and I'm sure I'll see you guys soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Johnny. Take care, man. Okay, later. Johnny Boychuk, uh, player development for the New York Islanders, uh, won a cup with the Boston Bruins. And yes, uh, sad note, I saw it in the inbox. Uh, the clubhouse at Northern Bear yeah, went down. Not good. Not good. Uh, that's a great golf course. Yep. A beautiful clubhouse. And uh, that's super sad. Super sad. That yeah. sucks, man. It's awful. That really sucks. Uh, big thank you to Johnny for, for stopping by. I don't. Maybe he, he does need a back skate. I he don't does. Know. You think he does? Hundred percent. I, I can't remember if he's hairy or not. You would know better. I just him. saw him recently. Yeah, he's he is hairy. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Two sweater guy. Get that man a back skate. Uh, all right. It is hello hockey. Tom Gazzola, Sean Bell, and YouTube Trev with you. We do have David Pagnotta coming up shortly. Uh, the hello hockey insider. What do you, you got? Something? No, I was just gonna say. I, I I fully agree with him on that Montreal. Stuff like it's well, uh, it's a hundred years of history between these two teams now. Boston yeah, celebrating I mean, its centennial this well, year. Well, the only the only home opener I was ever part of was Montreal, and so as I, a hab, of course, as a, as a hab. Yeah. And I vividly remember like they did it a little bit different. Normally, it's like okay, you're number two, you're number three, you're number four. We announce your name, you come out, you line up a little across the blue line. The year that I was there, we all came out first. Mm-hmm. Right, so we came out of the one tunnel. Everybody went to their to the blue line to their spots. Then they passed a mic to each player. Oh, and then you would say your name in French, and then as it went all all the way across, Markov was the last guy. Yeah, you had it. Uh, New Psalms did the Canadiens, which is we are the Canadians, yep. and that place erupted. 
Because, like, obviously Markov didn't talk a whole lot. Right, and he was Russian. And he was Russian. So the fact that he actually was able to get out at New Psalms de Canadien. Yeah. Like, I think the fans loved it. And it is, like, one of, still one of the most surreal things I've ever been a part of because you couldn't hear anything. Even though you're on the ice and, and sometimes that noise is muffled and, mm-hmm. you know, we you're in the stands, you hear people yelling shoot, but, like, half the time you can't hear people yelling shoot even though it's really loud. Right. Well, you're dialed. Right? In, right? It's so like, dialed, but... That place was so deafening, deafeningly loud that it was like the flip side, right? Like you weren't just in the zone. You were sitting there. You are watching it. You see the, the cell phone cameras. You, you hear the people. You see them like clapping. You know that it's so ridiculously loud, mm-hmm. but it almost like gets you into this little bubble. Yeah. Of like your own world where you're just kind of like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like you're looking around and it's, yeah, crazy. I call Bell Center the Cathedral of Hockey. Like, yep. going to the game there or to see a game, covering a game there is – it's amazing. I know it's not the Montreal Forum, mm-hmm. but, like, everybody there knows the Habs. Everybody there loves the fans. Girls, boys, men, women, young, old. Yep. Habs, 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 Habs. Eat, all live, it is. breathe, sleep, die. Habs. Yep. Uh – Rick Chartraw, who played for the Oilers on the 83-84 Stanley Cup winning team, also played for the Habs in the 70s when they were on that amazing run. He, when, when I, we did a documentary for Oilers TV on the 84 reunion, and I had Rick Chartraw a little bit, and I was like, well, what was it like being a Hab? Then you come to the Oilers, and you've got Gretzky and Messier and Curry and Anderson and Lowe and Fuhrer and coffee and all these great players and they're on the way up yep and you just came from the dynasty from the montreal canadians and then you just witnessed the dynasty that was happening with the new york islanders at the time he goes well we didn't really know like we knew these were great players good chance to win the stanley cup i was an old guy had been around for a while i'm not from he's an american guy and uh so you, you weren't really sure and he's we won the stanley cup and it was phenomenal what a team you know so many Great memories. And then I was like, what was it like being a Hab? He goes, I'll tell you this. We lost a game that we were supposed to win. I show up to the (laughs) forum the next day for practice. And there was a nun on the sidewalk as I was making way to the player's entrance. And I'm like the sixth defenseman on the team. And she starts hitting me with her cane. Yep. Telling me why I was terrible last night and why we were terrible as a team. And we shouldn't have lost that game. And she was, he's like, I didn't really understand what she was saying, but I knew what she was saying. It was in French. I didn't yep. really speak French, but she was hitting me with her cane. Man, it, it's true. Like, I, I remember I got called up. We, we lost to Colorado. So they did their, they did a Western swing. They played Vancouver, Edmonton, and Calgary. Mm-hmm. Then they came back to, to Montreal. I got called up, played my first game was against Colorado. We lose the game 3-2, right? So now they're 0-4. Yeah. Um, we have the day off, the guys go out, we're hanging out, we're at, uh, I can't remember what restaurant we're at, but some guy comes up to me and goes, Hey, are you guys going to ever win a game? I'm like, well, yeah, I think so. There's 78 <laughs> more games. There's a lot to play. Here, There's yeah. a lot to play. And he's like, well, we don't have any confidence right now. You guys have lost four in a row. Like, just snarky like that. Just giving it to guys. I'm like, Oh, okay. This is an old guy or a young this guy? This is a young guy. Young guy. And it's like. You know, we, we look at it in Edmonton, and, and obviously, you know, people here in Edmonton are, they're fiery. Mm-hmm. They want their team to do well. I'm not sure there's a fan base as passionate and or crazy as Habs fans. And I and I would put them above Leaf fans. Really? Yeah. I know a guy. It's, there's just a pride there that just, because they've been around for so long, because they've won so many Stanley Cups, mm-hmm. um, it, it's honestly, it's it's crazy. And here's another story. I was I was on the on the road trip with the Canadians alumni. Yeah. And we went up to Falaire and we, you know, we played a bunch of different games. I think St. Paul was another one. And we were we played this a senior team, and they dressed like twenty five guys, and they were coming to play. Yeah. We had like eight or nine guys, and so they gave us a couple of the older players or guys that could barely skate out. Honestly, one guy I think broke his ankle in no, the it's like oh, that sucks. they gave us up. Okay. So we're playing the game, we're losing. It's like one goal, 
whatever. Like it's, it's starting to get a little bit more serious because we're down in the third period mm-hmm. or going into the third period. And Matthew Dandino is like, hey, we're the Montreal Canadian. We don't lose. He's like, I don't care where it is. I don't want any more of these guys on the team. Get them out of here. No. Like, we're the Montreal Canadiens. We don't lose. And I was sitting there in the dressing room. I'm like, that's like, you don't see that kind of passion. And you guys are retired, We were retired. Did you guys lose? No, we won. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love it. Well, did you win? Yeah. So, okay, good to hear. Um... I know a guy who can speak to the craziness of Habs fans and Leafs fans uh, because he is from Montreal, works, lives in Toronto now, is all over the National Hockey League, happens to be our Hello Hockey insider. It is David Pagnata who will join us now uh, from Toronto. So, yeah, we we just had Johnny Boychuk on, and we're talking about rivalries. We're talking about goosebumps. Johnny said he would get the tingling feeling every time he was on the ice in Montreal when he was a Bruin because the rivalry was crazy and he said chasing around P.K. Subban and was was uh, uh, so annoying and he said that they would watch him and warm up and see him doing his choppy skating drills and they're like, what is this idiot doing? That's a quote. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. It is a quote. It is a quote. And, uh, and I was like, well, Dave knows all about what Montreal fans are like. Dave knows what all about or what. Leaf fans are all about. What would you say to the fanaticism of those two markets? Uh, Mon- yeah, I, I, Belzy hit it. The Montreal fan base, um, equally passionate as they are, freaking bananas. Um, <laughs> like, guys, do we even have to have that discussion? They won a playoff round. And flipped the police car. Yep, they awesome. won. They lost. They lost the game. They flipped two police cars. Yep. Like these guys. I was there during the the that their cup run when they when they lost to Tampa. I was at all of those all of their home games. It was the second round, and they were riding and throwing off fireworks and doing all kinds of stupid sh- stuff. Like <laughs> this is. I, I grew up with that crap. So, I mean, like, they, they are just different next level of passionate, stupid fans that you'll love to see because of how intense and how serious they take it. it this is not, this is not a, a pastime for them. This is a religion. Right. 100%. You know, like, yeah, like, that's, that's what it is for Montreal Canadian fans, for legit diehard crazy Montreal Canadiens fans from Montreal, from all over Quebec and from other parts too. That's what it is. Like Toronto and, 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 and Edmonton and Calgary and New York and Chicago and Detroit. Those are crazy passionate fans, but it's not a religion like it is to the Montreal Canadiens and, uh, and to enter their fan base. So that's the biggest differentiator. Like Vancouver fans are um <laughs> just say it they're 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 stupid crazy fans yeah um and they're passionate and all that but there's a different level of like it, it the vancouver fans are interesting like they're they're the most off the wall kind of you know kind of fans that i've that i've noticed edmonton fans are, are great passionate but you lose a game and you want to trade everybody so, like, there, and, and that's different markets too. But the Montreal fan base, it is, it is biblical. Uh, like don't that. don't they actually teach Montreal Canadiens history at school as a religion class? As a religion, class? I, I'm being not, dead serious. Not, I, I'm pretty not sure when that, I went. Not, not, <laughs> not when, when you went, there, but maybe there was. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing this a while back, where I think it might have been. Maybe Sportsnet, they came out and they're like, they're actually starting to teach Montreal Canadians as a religion class. Not a history class, a religion class? Religion. Because the Canadians have been around for so long that it's actually become their religion. And now it's like, this is it. They're praying to the ghost of Howie Morenz? I'm going to look this up, guys. I'm going to look this up because I'm telling you I'm not being crazy. 
when Jean Beliveau passed away and Guy Lafleur and all the big name guys, they don't do the procession at a local church. Mm. They do it at the cathedral that is next to the rink. It, it, it is so, I mean, that wouldn't surprise me, but this is like when one of their legends pass away, they have it at the cathedral, they have the ceremony there mm-hmm. and, and the funeral there and the procession, like they shut down roads for, for this downtown Yeah, on, yeah. I don't, it doesn't matter what day it is. It's a Monday, tough. It's a Wednesday, you're going to work late. They're having like, this is the, the prime minister attends. Over the years, the different pro- have attended right. the funerals of, of these athletes. I just like, found a Sportsnet it, um, article. Courses explores the course explores Habs and religion. Oh my god! Back from two thousand and nine. Okay, it's out there. Well, I mean, they pray to the hockey gods a lot. And- <laughs> You know, back in the day, I'm sure they prayed even more. Get the get the uh, get the priest in the in the locker room with them, going out yep. there in the second period of the Stanley Cup Final, um, smoking darts in the back and drinking <laughs> whiskey and going out there and praying <laughs> and going to play. It's the '60s. Why not? Yeah, why not? Uh, speaking of fans being a bit over the top, taking things too far, uh, this mm-hmm. Cutter Goche stuff. David, it continues to evolve. You're, you're seeing the, the the pushback, the craziness online. You're hearing John Tortorella making comments, the, the Kevin Hayes thing, and all of this. It seems like every day there's something new on this Cutter Goche thing. We haven't heard from the player. Um, I think that's probably smart for now. But how would you sum up? everything we've seen and heard and, and what is leading to all of this? Well, Cutter did one interview um, with, with the Ducks crew. Um, they're, they're all, and, and, he, sure. and I, he didn't really, he didn't address any of that, uh, sure. much of that stuff. Um, other than I, I think in, in the press conference, he said, or, or press call, he said that he, he had received death threats and, and things like that. Um, so the torch thing to me is, is an aside. I have no issue with torts going after the guy that had the Kevin Hayes talk that, right. that put out that, that, that speculation and, and that discussion. Um, so Philly fans, Philly fans are, are the best way to describe them would be using an expletive that I can't say right now. <laughs> um, but it's, it's after E and it's before G man. So, like, Philly fans are the guys that threw snowballs at Santa Claus. That's all you have to say. I, my, I, I wasn't there for this, but when Philly played Toronto in the playoffs those years ago, the whole Domi thing, yep. my buddies were at those games in Philly in Leaf Gear. Yeah. They locked them in the stalls and poured beer and everything on them until they threw their Leaf jerseys out of the stalls in order to get out. No. Um, yeah. Two, two, of my, two of my really close, really close buddies here, here in Toronto. Um, like those guys, those, that's a totally different end of the spectrum. You know, it's it's a it's a different kind of religion. That's like cult like um, <laughs> that that they have there. And the Philadelphia Flyers, in all honesty, and I've relayed some of this to to some of them um, within within management, did themselves in this situation zero favors by going on an all out blitz attack mm-hmm. against Cutter Goche. like the, Keith Jones, uh, uh, Danny Breer was mellow about it. So I, I, I'm, I'm more or less okay with what he did, but I mean, he, I'll throw him in there because it's the whole, it's the whole crew, the CEO, whose name I completely forgot. Hill, Hilferty, whatever, whomever it is. Um, their own media guys, like the guy that said that the, the Anthony Phil, uh, San Filipino does their, their team podcast. Right. Yeah. Like it was an all out attack against the character of cutter Goche. So to have, like I'm not surprised because some fans are totally nuts. Yes, um, and not just in hockey and in, in, in anything. Every yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like you're you're throwing out death threats to the kid and to his family and to Kevin Hayes and saying you're happy that his his brother's dead and that he wishes you know you wish that he's dead. Like all like all of that crap is primarily a result 
of unfortunately the Flyers' mindset in how mm-hmm. they went about this whole story. They could have said he didn't want to be here. It's unfortunate, but we're moving on because we just got a hell of a defenseman as part of this. He doesn't want to be here. Fine. Yeah. We understand. It's his choice. And then play up the whole acquisition of Jamie Drysdale. Yes. 100%. But the whole, he's, I feel sorry for him. The CEO said that he feels sorry for him when he comes to Philly next game when they play. You're enticing your fan base to go after the kid. That's where I have a problem. Fair. I have no problem with torts. So I, 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 and, and that is honestly, you know, he went to bat for Kevin Hayes in that situation. And they never really saw eye to eye, but they, you know, there's a respect level. You ask players that played for him, it's, it's a family. He will go to bat for his guys. And that's why so many people around the league. Oh, nope. no. We'll get Dave Just back. Just cut right out. We'll get Dave back. The death threats are ridiculous. Yeah, they really are. Seriously. They really are. Like To me, it's, they're not needed. The kid made a decision on where he wanted to play. It is what it is. If you're, you're really upset CEO about him, the boo, team. Him, boo him the next time. Sure. But Keith Jones, Hartnell, the CEO of the team, all these guys coming out. Dan Hilferty is his Dan Hilferty? Yes. Coming out and just absolutely giving it to this guy. Like... This isn't the first time this stuff has happened, a la Eric Lindros. Right. Obviously at a different but, time frame okay. where he didn't have the same social media to, to go at the guy. Yeah. But, like, okay. come on. Okay, here's the thing. I, I understand, like, Philly's a, a, a tough town, gruff town. Hey, don't you mess with us, one of us. Yep. You know, we'll mess with you. Don't ever besmirch Philly. I get that. But, and, and Dave's Dave's back, so we can bring him back on. But, like, Philly usually, in the world of hockey and other sports, gets their players. They are a destination. Yep. So to be this put off by a prospect, to go to those extremes about a prospect and say the things and do the things that some people have is beyond ridiculous, especially if you're a fan of sports in Philadelphia where you've gotten everything, yeah, everything they, you wanted. Anyway, Dave, they, you're back. They, they did this. Uh, sorry, getting cut out. I don't know if you caught the end. But, All good. But like, they they made a point to do this. They didn't save it for tomorrow, like the day after the trade. They did this that night yeah. during the team's broadcast. Yeah. So they made it a point to get these messages across. I, I have I have a lot of problems with that. That's. I mean, in yeah, in all of not, it, I think Tortorella's comments were probably the most mild. In the sense that he was like, "Oh, I don't know this kid from a hole in the wall." Like, yeah, you're probably you're right. You you've never crossed paths with them because you coach the team and you don't worry about this stuff until he becomes part of your organization. Right. He comes out yep. and skates with you. So I know that there's been people that have kind of attacked that comment. They're like, "Well, this is ignorant." And hey, Torts is doing what Torts always does, and he wants to talk about his current team, and that's that. Yeah. He doesn't care about anything else. So I and, understand and I think that. I- and, and honestly, I think it was just him trying to say, I, I don't I don't know the kid. I don't care about him anymore because he's mm-hmm. not here. Let's talk about Jamie Drysdale. He's our guy. Yeah. Yep. Like that's kind of where it was, but that obviously caught a lot of headlines. Yeah, absolutely. David Pagnato joining us now, our Hello Hockey Insider. You can catch him in the fourth period. You can also see him on NHL Network, and you can hear him on NHL Network Radio on Sirius XM, one of the Hosts of the Hot Stove on Saturdays. Uh, all right, Dave, there are some other uh, rumblings coming out around uh, the National Hockey League. Corey Perry looks like he can sign with teams. Uh, apparently, there's a lot of interest from a bunch of teams. I'm guessing you can get them for relatively cheap. Um, yep. And then another one that's intriguing and we'll get to for people around Edmonton is the Sean Monahan situation and the Habs trying to you know fulfill their agreement with Monahan to move him on at some point this year. So let's start with Perry, and, and what does that landscape look like right now for Perry? Uh, you're probably looking at around a million bucks prorated um, for for him. And, and um, if you're a contender, he's a hell of a guy to add. Um, like, the, the stuff that happened in Chicago, definitely unfortunate. It's, it's, you know, wasn't, it was a sticky situation, certainly. And I understand... Um, you know, the, their direction, given the, the recent history of, of the club. 
Um, but this is now you're bringing in a player that um, is is a playoff caliber guy, and mm-hmm. and so whether it's a team like Toronto or or Tampa, maybe trying to bring him back, or Colorado or Edmonton or or you know whomever Dallas, um, likely staying. I think it sounds like might might prefer to stay east, but you know we'll, we'll obviously you know we'll see who steps up because um, I think this is picking up or has picked up in the last you know couple of days here. Um, but I, I expect this to kind of be figured out relatively soon in terms of where he ends up. There's no rush per se. Mm-hmm. Um, the deadline for him to join a team is the trade deadline, March 8th. It's also a roster deadline for playoffs. Um, but he'll find a home. It'll be a, a, a mid-six kind of third line, probably kind of role on a cup contender. And they're probably, from a talent on ice perspective, going to be better for it. Sean Monaghan, what, uh, what's the scenario yeah. there for him? Yeah, so about a month ago, the Canadians reached out back to him and his camp to say, hey, we still want to go through with this. Do you want to look at staying here a little bit longer? What, where are you at? Um, and status quo from from his perspective. You know, wanted to get back into it. He's on pace for, was it, 40, 50 points this year for a team looking for a guy that can slot up the middle in either the second or third line, mm-hmm. probably more third line if you're a contender, um, then he's he's up for grabs. He's got a low cap hit. Um, he's, he's playing well, he can play in different situations and, uh, the Canadians are going to sit there and, and hold for on, on what they can get for him. I'm sure they're going to ask for a high pick. I don't think they're going to get a first round pick for him. Um, but you're probably looking at a second plus from, from a realistic asking standpoint, mm-hmm. um, for a, a potential 50 point player depth kind of guy. So for teams that are looking to shore up their center position primarily, um, he's going to be a plan B, plan C to, to some of the options that are out there, like an Elias Lindholm, um, who's probably on a plan A for a lot of teams. Adam Henrique might be plan B um, and Monaghan in, in that C range. So we'll see kind of how things develop over these next few weeks. But Canadians have been active. The Jets are a team that have been linked to Monaghan for a while. And he, or excuse me, the Jets had two scouts at their last game on, on Thursday wonder who they were looking at um, against the Sharks. I mean, San Jose's got a ton of options too, but yeah. um, pretty obvious who they were who they were keeping tabs on. Um, but uh, yeah, the Canadians might be in a position to get this market rolling from a rental perspective. What, um, if any, are the teams that are, if, if you know any, like if um, that are on Monaghan or guys like that? Uh, so the center position in terms of teams that want to shore that up, that will have him on their radar if they haven't reached out to the Habs already. Take a deep breath here. Ah, um, yeah. Boston, Colorado, Carolina, um, uh, 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 Winnipeg, um, Edmonton on a depth side in terms of third C, Toronto, three C, um, you know, side of things. Um there, there are a lot. There are a lot of teams. Boston, I think I, I don't know if I mentioned them already, um, but there are a lot of teams that are that are part of this mix that want to add at that position. Now, not everybody's going to going to obviously be able to afford four point nine five million dollar cap it of Elias Lindholm, and that's mm-hmm. a three prong asset that you're looking at. You're going to first round pick, a top young player, a slash prospect, and a third asset to Calgary if you want to get your hands on Elias Lindholm. Like Adam a- Henrique and and Monahan are probably in the same boat cost wise. Does it? Does Toronto have the cap space to be able to add a Monaghan? If the Habs eat half of that, uh, he's got a two million dollar yeah. cap hit. You, you bring him in for a million bucks, and the Habs are willing to retain. Um, on I think they have one slot left to retain. So I think they prefer to keep it for a guy like Jake Allen, um, who's got you know three point eight five. I think is his cap hit for another year. Um, but. I mean, in terms of Monaghan, they could be in a position to retain for a million bucks or you get a third team. But then all that retention just means you got to pay a little bit extra in order, asset wise, in order to pull that off. The Ducks, um, with Adam Henrique, for example, and he's got a $5.825 million cap hit, if memory serves, um, they are willing to retain half of his deal as well. But again, mm-hmm. it's going to cost you. So um, it just depends on where's the most economically friendly addition. And at the same time, uh, who looks best in my organization, in the room, all that, all that stuff. Speaking of the Ducks, recently there's some rumors that have been floating out there that there's a particular name that is on the mm-hmm. trade wire. Mr. Zegris. It's, it's been on since the summer. Well, there you go. What's going on with that? 
So the word in the summer around his contract dispute at the time was that he doesn't want to be in Anaheim long term. That's the that's that's that was the speculation around the summer and and around the draft, and there were some discussions around it. Um, obviously, didn't materialize, and it's eventually he waited it out. And you know, you get close to the season to make a, a deal like that is is pretty difficult. He's got a five point two five whatever it is cap hit. Oh no! Oh, he frozen. He froze. We'll get that he sorted gone. out. Oh, there, there he is. is. Oh, there Can he you hear is. Me? Yep. Yeah, you're back. Hello. Okay. All right. I'm not sure what's going on there, but um, uh, so he's got two more years left on his deal. So there's, and then he's an RFA. So there's controllability. Um, you want to see, you know, what you're going to potentially get for him. This is, this is going to be a monster type deal if it, yeah. if it does happen. And, and I expect this, I mentioned this on NHL network last week. I expect this to happen in the summer. If this does go down, this is a summer type deal. This isn't a, before the deadline type of uh, type of move. But his name's been out there since the summer, like I said. No surprise it's been popping up recently, although he did get hurt, so he's out a few weeks. Um, so that may quiet that down a little bit right now. Is it because um, him, and, him and Verbeek don't see eye to eye, or what is it here? I, I don't think it has much to do with, with Pat Verbeek. I, okay. think just, I, I think it's a personal preference. At least this is a speculation that I'm okay. repeating that I heard okay. over the summer, that, that it's more – a preference of not wanting to be in that market long term. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Another name that you want go to go ahead, with no, that go name. Ahead, go ahead. This is Jacob Markstrom. Now you know if people are yep. looking for a goalie because the goalie market sucks. To be honest with you, and you mentioned Jake Allen, and yes. I still I said it yesterday on the oil stream. I'm like, ah, gross. <laughs> anyway, that's just my personal opinion. But Markstrom seems tantalizing, and if you know Calgary's going to be going through this, this shuffling of the deck, resetting, whatever you want to call it. Is this a guy that we're going to see on the move at some point? Um, he, They are willing to trade him. Um, okay. They will not go to him. He's got a full no-movement clause. They're not going to go to him until they have a deal they feel is right. Okay. So uh, I think there's been a discussion, um, at least with, with his representation over at Newport, to say, hey, look, we're gonna we're getting calls. We'll explore it. If we get anything serious, then we'll come to you guys. But I don't think it's anything's happened beyond that. Um, one of the teams is New Jersey. New Jersey has had a very loose conversation about Jacob Markstrom, mm-hmm. um, six million dollar cap it, a couple more years left on the deal. Um, any any major move that Jersey does, no, they've been linked to John Gibson. We've talked about it before. They're, they're, they've had conversations, um, loose ones again to this point with Calgary about Markstrom. I'm sure they're going to have some type of conversation with Columbus about Elvis Merzlikens. If they're making a move for a big goalie, Vanacek's going the other way. From a uh, from a financial okay. perspective, he's going the other way as part of the deal. He's got a three point four in and around that range cap it. Um, you got to make things work financially long term. This yep. season, it doesn't matter that much because Dougie Hamilton and his nine million dollar cap hits on LTIR the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. But beyond, you got to be conscious of that. They're not going to spend nine ten million dollars on goaltending. Um, so Vanacek is more likely than not being the guy that gets moved there. But in terms of Markstrom, outside of Jersey, I haven't heard much else. Um, but I, I do know that Calgary is willing to move him, um, among others, that have term on their deal. Uh, but uh, it, it all depends on what the deal is that they can get for him. Just one thing I want to get to um, here, because we're, we're getting close to wrap up, but Barkoff yep. just became the points leader for the Panthers. Um, is this guy the most underrated player in the entire league? He's, he's up there. I mean, he is absolutely up there. I was just there on Thursday when they played the Kings. Um, and to see what he brings to the table again and seeing him in the playoffs last year and everything, his two-way ability, he's a big body that, I mean, if he used his body even more than, than he does, would probably, uh, you'd be talking about him a lot more. But yeah. he's, he's more on the defensive side than the physical side. Um, but he just uses his strength to his advantage offensively. And his 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 brain defensively, like this is a hell of a player, um, ridiculously good two way guy, and without question, not only their leader, but uh, uh, hands down one of the top underrated two way centers in the National Hockey League. How cold is it where you are right now? <laughs> it's not as cold as I saw. Are you guys really getting minus sixty tonight? That's news to me, but I I wouldn't doubt it. Feels like it. I had. 
I had two people send me screenshots of what the forecast is, and it's going to feel like something like that in Edmonton. It's 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 like minus. I think it's going to feel like minus fifteen or something here tonight, and then like all week is pretty cold. But you wearing shorts? No, I actually I've got because that sounds tropical. <laughs> Seriously, I've got my hoodie on. But yeah, it's, no, oh, it's well. I was just in. I just I was just in Florida. So um, oh and, really? Like, you know, Thursday was rainy all day and cloudy. Don't do, don't do that. Don't oh, do that. Only it was. Nope. Uh, but, I'm sorry to hear <laughs> don't that. Don't do that. But I'll, but I'll take it. Actually, Belzy, so Miami's in KC. I know. Minus 31. Oh, I'm so worried. It might actually yeah. force him to run the ball, which is actually the Achilles heel. <laughs> Man, I'm terrible. Like, yeah. Um, to your question, minus 50 tonight oh. feels like minus 60. Oh, oh, but the the minus fifty is the actual is the actual is minus fifty. The, the, oh my, <laughs> man! Like the, Are you serious? The coldest, yeah. the coldest I've ever experienced was minus fifty five. I think in 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 Saint Petersburg, Russia, um, when I used to go there to do some stuff for the KHL, and we did a bunch of stuff with the K and some reporting back like like 2008 9 10 wow uh went for a few years we were outside trying to do a hit on camera we had to do 30 second clips because the camera would freeze so we'd have to do 30 seconds run inside warm up come back out it was minus 55 it was not pleasant i do not envy you guys tonight that's that's rough it's yeah. awful well enjoy your margarita on the beach in minus 15 <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, either way, Tropical. either way, some adult beverages will help warm us up. Yes, that's very true. That's very true. Dave, great stuff as always, my friend. Uh, have a fantastic weekend. We'll catch up on Saturday coming up. Uh, ciao for now, my friend. Take care, boys. See ya. That is our Hello Hockey Insider, David Pagnata, bringing us the goods around the National Hockey League. Minus 50. I didn't even look at that. It's awful. That sucks. Uh, yeah. What did we learn today, Belzy? Uh, that we are 11th in the world in coldest places right now. And the other ones that top it are all in <laughs> Alberta. <laughs> you oh just learned God. that. Oh, my God. Well, stay warm out there. Hope you enjoyed the show. Big thank you to Kevin Radomski for stopping by, Director of Business Ops for the Edmonton Oil Kings. They're in action tonight against the Red Deer Rebels in Red Deer. Then they return home tomorrow, 4 o'clock, start against Spokane. It is an Elvis afternoon. Go check it out, uh, like, Radomski was saying they have some great deals, $10 kid combos for food, 20 bucks gets you in the door, and you get those first 1,000 fans, get the glasses with the, the chops for an Elvis afternoon with the impersonator there as well. For all those old guys out there, make sure you warm up your hips first before you start dancing because you don't want to break <laughs> something. All right, that's going to do it for Hello Hockey this week. Uh, big thank you to our sponsors, Local Public Eatery, Fox Coffee, and Backscape. Check them out, support them as they support us. And with that being said, we are going to say goodbye for Sean Bell and YouTube Trev. I'm Tom Gasola saying ciao for now. Stay warm. We'll catch you on the Oil Stream pregame show at 3.30 p.m. Bye-bye.